usual. So I'm going to ask um, Senator Williams. No, where'd he go? He gone. Oh, there you. Okay, <laughs> Senator Williams, if you would please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our dear Lord, thank you so much for many opportunities and blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Please uh, bless us all as we go forward trying to do the work for the state of Georgia. Please bless our men and women in harm's way and give each of us safe travels as we go back home. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We wait on one of our members to come back. So, Representative, you can come on up here and sit down if you want to. Let's wait on one. We wait on well. Here's one, and we got one coming out of this door too. And we're letting you go out of order because we love you. Okay. So remember, remember that when we go over on that side of the building. Okay. Um, so tell us um, the bill number and the LC number, and then um, you can start. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. You okay. Got there we Thank go. You. Thank you. So, uh, HB 607, it is an honor to be here before you today, and thank you. It's LC 50-0554-S. That is LC 50-0554-S. I'll let you turn to that. Okay, so this is an um, so virtually every house member that comes before this august body will say this is just a simple bill and it is um, this is an apples to apples bill um, so currently in the code uh, regarding the Zell Miller scholarship uh, one of the requirements in addition to the GPA of 3.7 uh, cumulative score of 1200 on the SAT or a 26 on the ACT. These are composite scores. So the, the problem is, uh, occasionally the college board who administers the SAT will change the SAT format mm -hmm. and it no longer becomes equivalent to the ACT. So, um, so for the past several years, the students that have taken the ACT exclusively are at a somewhat of a competitive disadvantage. So the way the SAT is scored right now, uh, the 1200 is in the 75th percentile, um, whereas the 26 that is in code for the Zell Miller is now equivalent to the 82nd percentile. So all this bill does is it, it allows for um, our student finance to adjust the ACT to match the 1200 score on the SAT. So it just makes it apples to apples equivalent. I think in your packet you'll have um, the document that shows what the percentiles are for the ACT, SAT, uh, but this is something that is uh, independently um, um, analyzed that our student finance president will have access to in order to make the equivalencies. So that's the bill. Pretty simple. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, number 12 is, oh, yeah. Uh, thank Jim. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the author. Uh, this is an alignment bill, is that correct? Yes, sir, so it we're, is. We're aligning ACT scores to the newly oriented SAT so that our Georgia students are not at a disadvantage. Is that correct? That is correct. Right. And the best thing about it is the student could take either one of these and still qualify for this for that, hope. That is correct. I think the, the bad news is the way it's currently scored, they'd have to take both of them in order to to be on par. So I don't want to have to go that far. Is, is that true? <clears throat> well, uh, so you, right now, um, so in a baseball analogy, uh, right now, if you take the uh, SAT, you're basically watching the pitcher uh, who is uh, giving you a hint about what he's going to pitch. Right. Uh, so if you're taking the S ACT, uh, ACT, uh, you're at a slight disadvantage. Right. 
And all this does is align that so that they are it, equivalent. You are exactly and, correct. Fine. Senator. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do all schools, I, I know some schools look at ACT, some schools look at SAT. What about in Georgia? It's different, different schools look at it different ways. Um, and, and that may be something for Mr. Senator Chairman, Burns. I would. If I, if I may, please, Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, yeah. Admissions will look at either of those scores. Okay. All right. And so admissions decisions are partially weighted on those scores, and along with their high school academic record and a number of other factors. But this is a, a qualifying for our, our uh, uh, more mean? demanding entry universities and colleges, and certainly it would be appropriate for, for HOPE to use this as a measure to determine eligibility. Okay, thank you. Senator Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, Representative, I know, I know the intent is, is alignment. Uh, but but when I read the bill, I, I didn't I didn't really get alignment out of it. But what, what I'm worried about, and if you can address my concern, is that when we give it all to the um, Student Finance Commission, that they could ultimately lower the standard for the Zell Miller Scholarship, and and I want to make sure we don't do that. Uh, no, sir. I, I don't think that that is not neither neither the intent uh, nor the language as I read in the bill. The SAT is fixed, so it's it it is aligning the ACT with the SAT. Yes, sir. Okay. Matching. I got you. And All right. And you still have to have a three point seven, right? You do. That is that is still the case. Yes, sir. Okay. How <laughs> you ready to go home? <laughs> uh, yeah, fourteen. Uh, yes, sir. Please. This may be the first time I've agreed with a House member that it is a simple bill. And I would make a motion to do pass. Yeah. Uh, and a second with Senator Burns. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Pass 100%. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. So very kind. You're very welcome. Sponsor, do you get Oh, yeah. Who's sponsor? I'll be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Burns. He explained it better than I did anyway. So thank you, Senator. <laughs> there was an opportunity to say something there, and I and I passed it up. Okay. Um, let's see. We're gonna go to House Bill 228, Representative Dempsey, who is always smiling. I don't ever see her; she's not smiling. And we appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we may have a um, this. Yeah, I think we may, may have a substitute. I, mean, I do. Let's see. Let me check. And y'all have got it in your folders. So it oh. should be LC four nine one four four two S. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Would you so, speak closer to the microphone, please? Yes, glad to. I'll scoot this chair up. <laughs> Aggravating. So this measure, some of you that have been on the committee for a while, you've seen it several times, the underlying bill, actually. Um, it did pass out of both uh, the House and Senate rules last year and did not make it out on the very last night. The intent of this is to deal with one of the challenges that we're facing right now in our state comes from the final recommendations of the Healthcare Workforce Commission, uh, December of 22, and dealing with particularly Georgia's healthcare education pipeline, the obstruction that is there, you know, for students, the financial aid, and the completion challenges. So to try, this is the underlying bill where we started. There have been some changes in this substitute, and I'll let each and every person speak to that as we go forward. But dealing with just that little bit of help that can come when you're in a private <coughs> college or a university can make the biggest difference. This is a school where particularly um, 
students go for their second or third career. They're mostly adults. It's very diverse. It's very fluid in how they can do it. It is a brick and mortar institution right here in Sandy Springs with the effort to expand to another one in Stockbridge because they have the unique ability actually to meet the demands of, of how many apply, how many students apply. There is not an athletic program. There are no other courses other than to graduate very qualified nurses so they can adapt in a way that most schools cannot. In the 2011 session, HB 326 changed the eligibility for private colleges and universities to qualify for the tuition equalization grant. The 33 schools and universities and colleges that existed at that time all were grandfathered in. Many are in all of the places where we live. I know where I am, there's Barry and Shorter, both. They teach all kinds of things, but this focus that I'm drawing you to today in the underlying bill is simply to expand a nursing school and address the huge challenges we are having in the nursing workforce. So if you will look at the bill and turn with me first to page four, section 1-4. This is the narrowly targeted amendment to the Georgia Tuition Equalization Grant. As you look at it, you'll see that it's very specific. It is for a qualified institution of higher education only with a baccalaureate degree granting institution of higher education only offering that baccalaureate program in nursing. It is accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and schools or by the Higher Learning Commission accredited by the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education with a National Council licensure examination for your average passage rate at at least 85%. We've made the bar very high. It will admit persons who have a high school diploma, state approved high school equivalency diploma, degree from an accredited post-secondary institution, students are eligible to participate in the federal Pell Grant program. They've been reviewed and approved for operation for receipt uh, from the funds for the Georgia Non-Public Post-Secondary Education Commission. They must be in Georgia. They must have a bricks and mortar uh, building here. Uh, they're existent in the state for at least five years and only institutions, baccalaureate degree program or programs in nursing shall be deemed to be approved in this subpart of this bill. Uh, the school that is specifically designed for uh, was established in February 2012. It has been here not for five years, but for 11, and is very proven with a high, high rate of nurses, not only who graduate, but who then sit for the nursing exam, pass it, and go straight into our hospitals and other healthcare facilities. I am open, Mr. Chairman, to either taking questions about this now, or if you wanna go through the entire bill and let each of the other members um, that are bringing theirs to us. Uh, we got one, one quick uh, question from um, Senator Harrell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the accreditation language on lines 49 to 53, does that not apply to your section that you're dealing with, but with somebody else's section? Um, it, it refers to the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Um, that is in it, another, that is another yeah. portion that was added here. The underlying bill is what I just went over. And that, that section is from Representative Bentley so Section I should ask one Representative two, so Bentley about that. It would that. be better for her to okay. explain that. And the okay. other, just so, just for y'all's awareness, so Senator Burns has a portion at one dash three, and then Senator Anna Vitarte, um at section part two, section two point one. I'll save the question for Representative Bentley then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is can Representative <coughs> Bentley come explain yes, that part? Yes, ma'am. That'd be then? great. Thank you. Please do. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, as uh, Chair Lady Dempsey mentioned, House Bill 
228, uh, the changes, the, the, the addition to the bill from um, lines 48 down to 53 um, is what I'm proposing. Um, this portion of the bill will allow for an institution which was previously accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, better known as SACS, and that is now accredited by the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools, TRACS, to be considered an approved school for purposes of tuition equalization grants. Um, and this will only impact two schools in the state of Georgia, which are Morris Brown College and Payne College in Augusta. And they are both HBCUs, and it will allow their students to utilize the HOPE scholarship. Um, Senator Harrell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Bentley, I'm very familiar with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, but I've never heard of the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools. Um, can you fill us in a little bit with that accreditation um, agency? Well, from my understanding, Senator, and thank you for that question, this, this uh, uh, association basically just uh, credits those institutions like Morris Brown and Payne College that are Christian um, institutions and so that's why this bill only reference those two institutions uh, Morris Brown and Payne College and they are part of the AME um, religious background so AME and CME yes okay if I may further Please. ask do you have any idea like how long this accrediting agency has been around? I do not, but I maybe our about 20 years. About 20 years, I've been just told. Okay, it mm -hmm. says covers 90 schools in 21 states and six overseas. Apparently so, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Senator Williams. Thank you, Representative Bentley. Will this affect the funeral business? <laughs> <coughs> It will help uh, educate some people to become funeral licensed funeral directors because, you know, we do have a shortage in this state for licensed funeral directors and licensed bombers. So this will certainly help in that regard. Yes, thank you for that question. I think I know what you're doing now for a living. Um, thank you. Senator, who, who, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for uh, Representative Dempsey. Online. 125 through one really 32 it talks about assessments um, and um, it talks about the the local school school superintendent working in conjunction with the department of juvenile justice and i'm all for getting these kids out of the juvenile justice system and getting them educated and getting them employed and get them on the right track but how does the local superintendent like in cherokee county do they work with the juvenile i, I didn't know they they had relationships there and and how that worked. Can you explain how that works a little bit? So this portion there is um, from Senator Anabatarte. It's Senate Bill 123, I think, that you all have passed, I believe. I'm not 100% sure if it passed out. In education, in education and youth. And I believe he is going to be here to speak to that measure. It is okay. not a part of the original bill. This became very popular today. And um, there are others. No, and, and listen, yeah. I want to reiterate I, I want to get these kids out of the juvenile justice Absolutely. system I want to get them educated I want to get Absolutely. them working and being productive citizens in our state I just didn't know our lo uh, I want to know how it's going to be coordinated my local superintendent's working as hard as he can to mm -hmm. run his schools and I just didn't know how he was going to continue um, be able to meet with the juvenile justice folks and how that was going to work absolutely I believe he has stepped in the room if okay. the chairman is Senator Anabatarte, I believe, just stepped in the room if y'all would like for him to address it. Yes, would you? Yeah, here he is. I'll let him. If we could, could we, could we finish this section before we go to? Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, I have a question. Uh, I, I, thank you. I, I appreciate the author uh, bringing this legislation and, and the concept, I support it. I, I, I've been around higher ed 30 years, and I, I'm not familiar with the trans, trans uh, transnational association of Christian college university. Is that correct? Transnational association. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Transnational. Uh, it, it, we're specifically you're suggesting we're specifically looking at Payne and Marsh Brown. Are there other 
uh, colleges in Georgia that are a part of this accrediting group? Mr. Senator, those are the only two that I'm aware of, Payne and- well, If I look at their member institution role, and if I've got the right website- For Georgia? For Georgia, mm -hmm. I see the Atlanta University of Health Science in Swanee, Georgia, just on the first page. I see Beulah Heights University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I see the College of Athens, formerly Athens College of Ministry in Watkinsville, Georgia. And that's just on page one of four. So my question is, would this legislation open all of those schools up for, for access to TEG and HOPE? Mm -hmm. Well, my portion of the bill, thank you for that question, only reference Morris Brown and Payne College because they are the two HBCUs. Um, Could you point that out, please? Where is that referenced in your, in your legislation? It is not actually referenced in the lines on the bill, but um, just in from my knowledge of the two but institutions. That, the, the trick is they were they were previously accredited by SACS. That's right. That's the limiting factor. Is that correct? That's correct. They were previously accredited by SACS. If I could. And Morris Brown, both uh, both of them have been previously. Now. Right. And. Can you explain the accreditation issue with why they are no longer in SACS or, or, or choose not to participate in SACS? SACS is the, is the normal accrediting for higher education. Yes, sir. Sure, yeah, if, sure. The, if yeah. the chairman please. will allow. Please. Yes, yes, sir, yes, please. Yes, sure. please. Um, uh, members of the committee, my name is Andrew Long. I'm the... <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Andrew Long. I am the uh, consultant for Morris Brown College here in Atlanta, Georgia, and for Payne College uh, in Augusta, Georgia. And there are nine schools, I believe, in Georgia that are accredited by tracks. The only reason why it would only apply to these schools is because these two schools are the only schools that were formerly accredited by SACS and now are accredited by tracks. It will not apply. TEG will not be opened up to any of the other schools that TRAX uh, represents, just Morris Brown College and Payne College in Augusta, Georgia. Now, the reason, well, specifically for Morris Brown College, poor management, poor leadership, mismanagement of funds, they, have, they were down for 18, I think 20 years. But on April 26th of last year, they, they regained their accreditation and um, they, they are back. And for, children, for students who are trying to attend Morris Brown College, which has one of the lowest tuition rates of any of the HBCUs in Georgia, the, getting that TEG funding would mean everything for them and their majority uh, first time college uh, students, first generation students. And under new leadership as well. Right. Yes. Th th yes. Thank you. And, and, and I appreciate that. And let me say, I'm very familiar with Payne College and, and the challenges they've overcome. Yes. And I'm very proud of them and I'm very supportive of Payne. I'm very supportive of Marsh Brown. I just wanted to clarify that we're not expanding that no, beyond no. with tracks accreditation because right. thank you for the clarification thank, thank you thank you sir thank you, and, and if we want to make sure we reiterate that that they are both under new leadership better leadership now so yes things are much better now yes ma'am i yes. think we've read that in several places <laughs> thank you <laughs> um can i bring senator anabartardi up he come out from behind the wall <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't see you over there, man. Oh, you're, you're good. Yeah, I was worried about you. Tell us where you're I'll, at. And, I'll come and out from whatever what? walls to get a bill pass. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But tell, tell us where Colleagues, you're thank you. Are. Um, so our part, uh, Senate Bill 123 is basically Section uh, 2122. Um, and I'm going to let Michael and also uh, Joe Ferrero, who's the Deputy Ad Adjutant General, talk about this. So oh, to yeah. Senator Beach's question, um, this uh, does touch on juvenile justice and expanding uh, the, the opportunities, but also to the ASVAB piece, um, which I know General Cardin supports, um, has requested um, for us to try and get that piece done um, around that. So I'm going to let uh, Michael come up and then, uh, well, actually, I'm going to let Joe come up. And then Michael, military always first. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Please tell us your name and your and what you do. 
Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm Joe Ferrero. I'm the Deputy Adjutant General for the Georgia National Guard. Uh, thank, you. thank you for giving the opportunity to be here to speak today on uh, behalf of that portion of the bill that affects uh, testing uh, for uh, military aptitude. Uh, so nationally, 4% of, of um, service age uh, youth get the ASVAB test at school. 96% uh, then obviously don't. We, this bill would allow uh, the military entrance processing system to have access to the schools on a broader basis to test uh, high school students, 11th and 12th graders, mm -hmm. uh, so they can uh, be, uh, we can assess their abilities and uh, their recruitability into the military. Another part of this that I think is important for you to know is nationally again, only 23% of recruiting age uh, youth, 18 to 24 years old in this country, only 23% are eligible to join the military because of educational deficiencies, physical issues, and criminal involvement. Oh, wow. So uh, we're down to recruiting out of a, a population base of 23%, and if only 4% are, are getting tested in high school, it really puts some roadblocks in our ability to recruit uh, soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, and, uh, and, and now Space Force personnel for, um, to defend our country. Um, so that, this, this bill would uh, allow the schools, or would actually, the schools would give the test for students who want to take it. It doesn't force every kid to take it, but it makes it available for those who want to take it. And that helps us then identify the kids that we can talk to and recruit them uh, for a possible future with the military active duty guard reserves. Sir Payne has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Good to have you here with us. Uh, my question was, I'm looking at this and having worked with the Department of General Justice for 30 years, my, uh, is this something that's been worked out with DJJ that they're, they're open to because this puts a lot of burden on them too? So the DJJ part, is is something that is is a different section um our our section is just dealing with the military testing the, the one that i'm speaking to yeah, so, so i'm no. sorry so <laughs> mike here can mike mike can speak to that. yeah thank you uh so senate bill 123 in, in its, its introduced form was a uh, emphasis to provide students with guidance for you know, career and college pathways and help them be better informed to make the best right decision for them. The, the section here that, that we have spoken out in favor of, Section 2-2, deals with uh, being able to ad and, and encouraging districts to administer a uh, you know, college readiness aptitude test, a ACT or SAT, uh, during school time, during school hours, uh, uh, at least once for juniors and seniors. That is... Uh, a policy that more than half the states the, in the in the nation do offer. Uh, most uh, uh, provide that. Some states have it as a requirement. This is not a requirement. This is optional for all students who want to take it. The section here is just about coordinating with uh, uh, coordinating with the superintendents and DJJ. Uh, to give those students the uh, uh, the same opportunities to to take the test um, puts Department of Education in, in charge of how that coordination looks like. I have not heard anything from DJJ uh, in the two years that we've pursued this at at any point, um, raising any sort of concern about how this would operate. The reason I ask that question, if I may, yeah. Mr. Yes, Chairman, the reason I ask that question is because you know the kids from DJJ are reserved confidentiality for uh, for one, and so I mean for a kid in RYDC, I mean um, that confidentiality. How do we get past that barrier that you know the, so the military or whoever's coming in to assess these kids? I mean it's not imputing yeah. that that ability for those kids to. Yeah. It. So again, this is providing those students with the opportunity to uh, to participate in a test taking. And again, the uh, 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 what I should have mentioned is that I, I know the ACT and I believe the SAT do offer on-site 
uh, testing to take place, which could be an available option. Uh, it doesn't necessitate uh, DJJ to uh, uh, coordinate in, in any way that um, would break confidentiality. They, they could, you know, they, they've got some flexibility in how they do it. In the end, it's, it's just a matter of making sure that that is an available course if a student chooses to take the test. Okay. Well, thank you. Senator Beach. Mike, I was told that uh, Section 2.1 and 2.2 uh, could cost the state $5 million. Is that accurate? And if it is accurate, who's going to fund that $5 million? So that that's not entirely accurate. So d the 2.1 uh, is, is entirely paid for by uh, the Department of Defense, and there is no cost in involved. 2.2... Uh, is if you are to make it a statewide. However, as you see in Section 3.1, uh, there is a you know mechanism for Section 2.2 and 2.2 only that um, does not put an unfunded mandate on on the program and instead makes it so that it is uh, mm -hmm. that this section is is not uh, in effect. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the will of the committee? Oh, we got one more question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Question here. Um, I, I'm trying to understand who, who would administer the assessment for, for the military uh, testing. Uh, I, I, I'm, oh, I, I'm good with the military. I, okay. I think I think you, you're, you're. I think my, my concern is section two two. Yes, sir. So two two point two. It would be administered. Uh, by the school much in the same way. So if you think about how students, uh, the state pays for the PSAT for 10th grade students, all students and all 10th graders in the state take the PSAT that is administered you know, by the, the school during school hours. This is just mimicking that for, uh, you know, for the purpose of a, you know, uh, the, the SAT itself rather than the and And, and who developed the assessment? And what is the cost of the assessment? I going back to Senator Beach's question on line 118 with state funding. Yeah. So but who 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 where is the who created the assessment? Yeah. So that that is the ACT or SAT. So you're going to administer the ACT SAT. Now again, now there's a big difference between a PSAT and an SAT. Yes, sir. And a PSAT is administered in schools. SATs do not administer. They administered in colleges, universities, on central sites. I'm not aware. Unless there are some large environments where an SAT would be administered in a local school setting, unless there, somebody there can help. Yes. Yes. yes, they do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. There, there, there are many. But my concern so. is, what is the cost of an SAT? So, what you've seen uh, again in in most states, uh, more than half states in the in the country do provide this program, just just like this. Uh, Okay. In, in, but in many, in, my in, in, and, and in many cases, what they would do is they would uh, be able to to negotiate a lower price than what your your sticker cost is. And the, the estimate is? is the estimate is about five million dollars, is what I've been told. Five million dollars, and what is the cost per student assessment? And how many students are you going to assess? So there are a hundred and fifty thousand, uh, roughly. 11th and so you're going to administer this test to every student in Georgia who chooses to participate but they could all choose because they get a free SAT they they could I would hope so that that uh, that is the goal so in in Atlanta in APS uh, through a private foundation achieve Atlanta they have been doing this for I want to say four years now and why uh, would they continue to do that if it is with state funding a a APS is only one, one school district out of out of many. And why uh, would any school district choose to do it? It is, it is in the best interest of children to be able to have a, uh, to be able to take this test early. The research shows, the, and, and that's the reason why why we've been supportive. The research shows this is a proven mechanism to increase college going rates to increase. Uh, college application rates to increase college going rates among low-income 
uh, and and um, minority students and and increases individual SAT or ACT scores by moving it up. So, was, it, excuse me, one more one more question. Yes, sir. Was that not the intent of the pre-SAT to to indicate the the capability of a student to pursue uh, additional education? That is one of the one of the reasons. Yes, sir. And and so we we offer. As a state, we offer that assessment for all 10th graders. That's correct. Uh, and but we don't offer the same opportunity for for the actual okay. test, the SAT or ACT. We got one more speaker. Sure. If you would please. Yeah. All right. Help me. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. So my name is Emily Ona, and I re actually represent ACT in the state. And so what we can kind of speak to is, you know, as Michael has said, and he's he's been working on this for a long time on the advocacy side, but from our perspective, he mentioned over half half the U.S. is already doing this. Um, really, what, what the goal is and what our mission is, is ACT actually is a nonprofit and focuses on those kids that are underserved, you know, don't have as much access as other kids. So what ACT does is they actually offer four free fee waivers just to all kids that want them that qualify. The problem they're having is they the kids in rural districts, particularly not APS, like you said, APS is already doing this. That's not the that's not the issue. It's it's kids in rural districts, kids that are underserved that are having to drive an hour, two hours to go take a test. So really the point of this bill is to allow the school districts to offer that during school hours. There is a funding piece that we hope, you know, at some point could be where school districts apply for that. However, that's the goal right now for the bill is to allow schools, en encourage schools and really with those local school districts to offer it during school hours in the districts. So that way they're getting the same access that APS is. Um, you know, we could have, you know, we can still go after funding, but the, 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 the thing about this bill too is until there's funding, we will not be requiring any local school district to do it. You know, that's only so on them. There are a lot of advocacy organizations that already do that, which is how APS does this, does that. And then this would allow those, like I said, rural districts to kind of offer that there. And that's from our research. If I, if I, may, Mr. Chairman, I, I represent a lot of rural school districts and I have school districts that have less than 200 300 students in the entire high school yeah they would have less than a hundred students in a in an 11th grade or a 12th grade so you've got a pool of very limited yeah. and that's why they tend to go to more consolidated testing yeah. and I am concerned about uh, administration in in an environment where where they're very low numbers. Yeah. I can only speak from ACT's perspective here, obviously on behalf of them, but from my understanding, they do this, like I said, they're doing this in many states that are very rural, and for them to provide those opportunities for kids on the on the college admissions, they're kind of fine with that. I will say that in, in most school districts, it's actually administered by teachers, um, and, and we have talked to a lot of the districts if this would be a burden on them as well, just to be clear, and we have not, and to them, they don't see it as a burden because it's providing that opportunity. The other piece I just want to mention, too, is, is I know we also know every kid's not going to go to college, and that's why we wanted to make sure there was a workforce credential that offers mm -hmm. those opportunities for as well for other students as well yeah my, my uh, well, i apologize mr chairman but uh, my experience with administering these tests on a college campus is the the ability to uh, validate the student and proctor the exam in an environment where there's uh, assurance that that student's evaluation is valid mm -hmm. I would say that that's going to be a difficult challenge if you ask a, a classroom teacher to evaluate her students or his students. And I have just concerns. And if my math's right, we're looking at about $30, $35 per student. Is that about right? Yeah, it really said so that the, it, this would go to a dish from, like I said, a di again, from ACT's perspective, this, it depends on how, so this would still be like a local control situation in most states. So the district would contract with, college board or ACT or for workforce credential, whatever that is. And, you know, I think that that's probably on average, but I think that price depends on what that contract looks like, just to be clear. But to your, to your numbers, that seems right. I would say the average, like I said, test for an ACT is, is around that, um, so 35 to 40. 35 um, to $40 and, and 150,000. Um, so, so yes, but like I said, they do offer those free fee waivers for kids that qualify, which that's really important. And then to understand, and then, like I said, there's, 
there's the idea that it is we want to make sure this is opt-in not so that kid that way you know we're, we're assuming not every kid's going to take one of these tests but that is maximum number yes sir sort of more uh, thank you mr chairman so when i graduated high school in 2012 so i guess 10 years ago now um <laughs> i'm sorry i didn't mean to disrupt the committee <laughs> i even feel old now so <laughs> um and I, and I went to a, a very rural school. I think there were like 140 people in my class. I'm not as rural as some, but I, I remember a, taking this test uh, in the cafeteria. We were all brought in, and someone from the Air Force was there administering it. I'm not sure what capacity that person was in. But, but if we're going to spend $5 million, where does that $5 million go? Is someone, is someone profiting from this? I mean... That would be for the, that is if you do for the college admissions test or the career readiness assessment. And that's just, like I said, that's a, that's a rough number, but that would actually go for whoever's going to admit, like who's providing the test. And then, and then there's going to be a voucher for people to take the ACT or SAT. Is so, that part of it? So the, the, all that would be decided on a district level. So a local school district essentially would, would purchase a contract. They would do an RFP process for with who's going to provide that test is my understanding. I think for what you're talking about with the military testing, and I let Joe speak to that, that's a little different than the, the, the college admissions and career readiness. But Thank you, Senator Moore. Um, so about the uh, ASVAB testing, we'll call it, but it's not called out specifically as ASVAB testing in the bill, but it's military vocational testing. That, that is provided by the military. Okay. That, that is no cost to the school, no cost to the student. That is handled through the military entrance processing system, MEPS. Um, they, and they're the ones who send out the, 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 the Air Force sergeant or an Army sergeant or whatever to proctor and give, to give the test. Uh -huh. um, so that is no additional cost to the state, the school, anybody. That's just giving the MEPS personnel uh, more access to the school and the students to test them. Because I had the same thing. We, we got sent to the gym. And the sergeant gave us the test, and 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 they they went away with the results, and and then if you wanted to, you could mark that that the recruiter could call you, and then if you mark that, then they would they would call you up and see sure. you know what they could do to work with you. So so I'm I'm further confused now. So so what exactly are is this section of the bill doing? So two one just gives right as I as I mentioned earlier, only four percent of high school students now get the test at school most of the kids we recruit why, why is it the military going into other schools because they're not allowing us in so this bill would allow allow us readier access to go in and test them it's changed a little bit since you and i took took that test where the schools open the doors it, it just hasn't happened and so this would open the doors for the for these meps personnel to go in and give the test only to the kids who wanted to take the test so this section this section is is mandating that schools allow them in it allows it allows uh, the meps personnel in yes sir okay thank you mr chairman thank you both here we go turn back um we got some other presentations what's the will of the committee on this not ready for that so i'll make a motion to table okay okay second all in favor? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, hold on. Okay, we got speakers. Okay, um, Senator Harrell. No, excuse me. Right. At the proper time, I'd like to make an alternate motion. All right. Can I get a clarification? Yeah, of course. Just point of clarification. We have a multi section bill. If I understand correctly, section 1.1 1. 1 2 is House Bill. Yeah. Sorry, House Bill. What is the House bill number? What was the House bill? 228. 228. Did that bill go through the House and was it adopted? 1.2 was not part of 228. No, 1.2 is 641. 641. And did that bill go through House committee and was it was it acted on by the House? This year it did not. Last year identical language passed the House and that's what's Gotcha. Yes. Thank you. Thank All right. Thank you. And then. Uh, I know that section 1-3 is Senate Bill 137. It passed this committee. It was adopted by the House, and it was in the House Higher Ed recently. So we know that's been vetted. Section 1-4, what is the House bill? It has passed. It has passed. And the House it bill is number? the original underlying bill that was sent over here. And it's the number is what we're working on, 228. right? 228. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. 
And in uh, section 2-1 is Senate Bill 123, is that correct? All and I'm uh, sorry, all section 2-1 and 2-2 two, two, or just two or just one and two. And uh, House Bill 123. Senate Bill. Senate Bill 123. You're right. Sorry, Jace. Uh, and and did it go through committee and has been to the floor? Mm -hmm. Right. It was ready for a floor yeah, vote. All right. Yeah. All right. And then section 3 1 is just got you. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Thank you for clarification. I think, Senator, um, we, let, let's hear from you. Well, prior to making an alternative motion, it seems like there are a couple options besides t tabling the entire bill. Um, we could um, strike part two, or we could, um, in a couple of places, change shall to may in part two. Is there any discussion about those two ideas? Well, we, we will have at least one meeting next week, and, and we we'll probably will have two. So I, I think there's still some clarity to this that we need to have. Um, I'd rather for us to, to carry it over. I, I, we apologize. Okay. But I'd rather for us to carry it over and clear up some things. That, and I think we got a motion in us. Had a motion and a second at the table, right? Okay, so is that okay? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So you're proposing we table it now, but take it off the table in another meeting in a few oh, yeah. days? We'll, we'll, we'll yes. definitely have it at least. We'll have at least one meeting next week, and we'll try. We're going to try to have two. So we'll try to. We will definitely bring it back at one of those. It will be. The, it will be the number one on the list. Is that okay? Thank you. All in favor of that? Raise your hand. Uh, 100%. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Um, we will now. Um, I want to see Mr. Representative Jaspers. He here. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I see Kim. I have Senator Jackson. Okay. Um, we're going to go on and start with Senator Jackson. Um, and she has. Okay. I didn't know. Well, it didn't clear out a whole lot. They went out of order. Uh, we going if he um, if he shows up. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> he's not here. He's not, he, I think he's stuck here. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we could be amenable to coming to some compromise around that, Chair. Sure. Certainly. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we are working off of Senate Bill 264, which is LC 500510. All right. Thank you. And I, I want to begin by thanking the Chairman for allowing us to have this hearing. This is um, such an important conversation for us to begin. And so, um, as you can see from the sign up list, there are many people who are very much interested and invested in this issue. Um, so very briefly, what this bill does is that it allows people who are resettled here in Georgia uh, via a special immigration status. So what we're talking about specifically are people who served um, and helped our military in Afghanistan. Um, people who have been um, clearly on our side when it's come to those wars. They've come here with special immigrant status, and this bill would allow them to receive in-state tuition uh, upon being resettled here. 
I think it's important to note that none of those folks that are come here have come from another state. They don't have another state where they could get in-state tuition, right? Oftentimes, this is what we're thinking about. We're like, oh, we don't want somebody who lives in South Carolina, say, um, where they could get in-state South Carolina tuition. We don't want them coming to Georgia and getting our in-state tuition. For people who come here who are resettled by our federal government, Folks who have been our friends, who have gone through extreme amounts of trauma and yet still been dedicated to uh, this country. People who resettle here, this is their home state. This is in state for them. And so this bill would allow those who have a humanitarian parolee status, a special immigrant status, to be able to continue their education and to do that in a way that's affordable by receiving in-state tuition. If with that, I, there are a lot of people who signed up, and so I, I'm happy to yield as much time um, to them if that would be helpful, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask, ask a quick question? Oh, please. Um, I, I, I think um, maybe Senator Payne and I had a conversation about Dalton, Georgia, and the um, um, Hispanic population in Dalton and, and, and so forth, and, and the parents are refugees, but children are, I guess the children are also refugees in the school system up there. And consequently, when they graduate from the school system, they don't qualify for in-state tuition. Is, is that a part of all this? So actually, that's a separate bill. Um, so and, and one certainly that I hope that many of us would support in the future. Um, so ch the children that you're referring to um, often have DACA status. So um, they are children who, who came with parents of their known, not, no of court of their own, right? These children are, these young adults, these are, these are young adults or, or, or children. They're coming here um, with legal status from mm -hmm. day one. Um, they, on day one, uh, not only did they come here with legal status on day one, they were picked out, right, from Afghanistan, from the countries that they were, um, and recognized and acknowledged as having either assisted the U.S. military as interpreters or um, being people who are extreme in danger of being harmed because of their um, support to the U.S. military. So these folks arrived on day one with legal status in our state as a special immigrant, um, whereas the folks that you're talking about don't have legal status. So okay. this bill would be very clear and very specific um, to folks with legal status to be here in this state, and this is their home. Senator Payne. Yes. So would, this, would this apply to um, my question? Is because I'm in my military. I, I remember we had a gentleman that was actually uh, from Nicaragua, and he was serving in next to us in the first 504th Infantry of the 82nd Airborne Division. And you know, and, was, and I come to realize since then that we have a lot of non-citizens that are serving in our military. And so, with this, for those who are living here, this would allow them, if they were living in Georgia and stationed at Fort Benning, and that it would be allow those to access. I, I'm going to bring in my specialist here. I, I don't think that's accurate. I have a different bill um, f to allow those folks to become peace officers in our state. But um, this is Darlene Lynch. She really is my expert who can answer that question definitively. Okay, thank you. So again, tell us who you are and, sure. and who you represent. I'm Darlene Lynch, and I'm a lawyer here in Georgia. And I represent the Business and Immigration for Georgia Partnership. It's a partnership of uh, refugee and immigrant serving agencies in the business community. Um, and so to answer your question, uh, as, as Senator Jackson said, it's not possible to become eligible after you're here. You have to be admitted to the United States as a special immigrant visa holder. So a, an interpreter from um, Nicaragua would not have that would ha would not have that ability. They'd have to be from Afghanistan or Iraq. However, if they were a humanitarian parolee um, approved before coming to Georgia, yes. They, okay, they, so this is specifically for those in Afghanistan and Iraq. And for others who have humanitarian parolee or other special immigrant okay. status, okay. but it's not something you can. Well, the reason I identified that because this was in the 80s, and at the time <laughs> Nicaragua was our, our, right. our <laughs> and that was always one of those questions. And he he fled Nicaragua yeah. in a very t tough time to and joined the military to s serve our country. Mm -hmm. Senator Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, 
I'm just trying to understand what a special immigration status is. Sure. And uh, if I if I read it off the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Homeland Security website, it says special immigrant is a non-citizen who qualifies for a green card after meeting certain criteria. So it doesn't say anything about assisting the U.S. or the state of Georgia for that matter. Do you want to say something? So that we're, this bill addresses three categories of people. Refugees, I think most folks are familiar with the U.S. refugee program that dates back from the Vietnam War, and, the, and Georgia's program dates back four decades. Special immigrant visa holders are, there's three programs that the U.S. government have set up. The oldest program, they're all referenced in the bill, would apply to interpreters from Iraq and from um, Afghanistan who served as interpreters or translators for a certain period of time and applied for an SIV and then came here. The more recent programs, there's another one for Iraqis and the most recent one for Afghans who had supported or acted in a trusted role with the U.S. government. They have to get approved by the, the head of mission um, and then they apply for an SIV uh, uh, permit. They wait many, many years, up to three years now, to get that, and then they come. So all three of those SIV programs are for people who supported the U.S. military or the U.S. mission in those countries. And then the last program is for humanitarian parolees. <laughs> And just to hopefully alleviate some of your concerns, we do spell out the exact code section in the federal law. If you look in lines uh, 19, starting line 18 through 22, so we're not um, we're not talking about just special immigrants, but we do specify the exact um, types of special immigrants that Miss um, Lynch just, or Attorney Counsel Lynch just referred to. Okay, yeah, I'll certainly have to go read those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Senator Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you to the author and to those who support the legislation. I, I certainly support the concept. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's worthy for us to acknowledge the service of those who've helped our country. A few quick questions. Are other states offering similar benefits? Could you, could you, uh, could you share that and kind of give me an idea of what other states might have chosen to do? Yes, yeah, so uh, there are other states. I know Tennessee um, specifically uh, Council Lentz might be able to add some more. Um, so some of this is about clarifying the law. If you if you look there, um, there is a sentence, um, I'll see if I can refer to the line, where the Board of Regents is given some opportunity to determine. So if you look at, um, I think, line, uh, starting line 12, 12 through 14, uh, the Board of Regents has some leeway already written into the law. And so in other states like Tennessee, um, they've actually chosen to interpret um, that those who come as humanitarian parolees, who come with these SIVs, that they are, that they qualify. They didn't necessarily, they've interpreted that and, and decided to have that kind of generous read already. So I know that's one example, if uh, Councilor Lynch can offer more. Right, and so different states are doing it different ways, but right now there are 10 states who pass similar legislation, and some of them include Colorado, Vir Virginia, Ohio, Wisconsin, Vermont, both Democrat-Republican states, and right now there are five pending, including in Utah is the most recent one, um, similar legislation to this bill. Thank you. Uh, another follow-up, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, how many students do you feel would be a part of this qualifying group? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, and and that's something we're trying to kind of get a hand handle on, and we're not we're not one hundred percent sure. We believe there'll be somewhere in the hundreds. So two, we're three, talking yeah. hundreds, not thousands. We're not probably. talking we're not talking thousands at all. We're talking somewhere in the hundreds. All right, and then one more. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but uh, have you had these discussions with USG and TCSG? Absolutely, and those and are are they. How, how, what their response, how do they feel about it? We're, we're continuing in those conversations. So uh, yeah, those discussions yeah. have been ongoing. Um, this legislation, I think the fact that we're having this conversation, this is a bipartisan piece of legislation that many of you um, on the majority side have signed on, um, I think will help us in that conversation. Yeah, it, it, would, it would impact their tuition, but I, I recognize that uh, um, they, they just need to be a part of the conversation. That's all I have. And, and they are. They absolutely are. Would you like to add to that? Or? No, I think that's fine. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Why, why don't we bring up a couple of speakers, let them, let them have about a minute and a half each. Absolutely. And so I'll, 
I'll let you choose. Okay. Um, do you have the list? I do. Actually, I've got another list. Do you want to pick? Um, sure. Who's going to speak? Um, I think if we'll have Jonas yes. come first. Can I speak? Yeah. Did you want to testify? I yeah. To testify well, Jonas. we'll begin with Darling, and then we'll have Jonas you want speak. Me to go? Where do you want them to testify from, Mr. <laughs> Chairman? Yeah. Where Where would you like? Do you want them to do it from oh, here? Oh, sit right there. Yeah, right, right there. Here? Yeah. Okay, I'll switch with you. <laughs> Um, thank you all and, uh, for the opportunity to share our support for this bill, um, and thank you for the sponsors of this bill on this committee. Again, my name is Darlene Lynch, Chair of the Business and Immigration for Georgia Partnership. I want to um, start by saying this bill arose out of months of work on the House side of a bipartisan study committee on how to maximize Georgia's global talent. And what we recognized is that one in 10 Georgians is foreign born today, one tenth of our population. Um, one seventh of our workforce is foreign born. And yet we have so much talent that we have yet to tap. And so the Global Talent Study Committee um, looked at what are the barriers, how can remove the, we remove those barriers? And the number one recommendation was to address the barriers to admission to Georgia public colleges. That was the number one recommendation for really strengthening our workforce. Um, and every member of that committee, both Republicans and Democrats, sponsored the, the bill, the version of the, of the bill you have before you today in the House last year, and that was HB 932. So today we continue the work, and we have a companion bipartisan bill in the House as well. And that bill, sponsored by Sen uh, Representative Holcomb and Hitchens, both U.S. veterans, uh, so there's a lot of support for this bill. Um, we've been doing a lot of education around this bill. And as I said, it's part of a national effort to recognize the support that people from other countries have given to our country overseas. I just want to uh, clarify a little bit about Georgia's history uh, in this uh, regard. Georgia has a 30 seconds. Okay, proud history dating back four decades of welcoming refugees. Um, they're vetted, screened, and approved by the U.S., and then resettled with the state of Georgia's help. We have a state refugee program. And so we resettle a few thousand people every year, including many children mm -hmm. and youth who had their education um, disrupted. The bill makes a very small change, um, as we said, um, to ensure that they are treated as in-state students as soon as they are resettled here because they have no other state uh, to go. I'll end by saying this bill addresses several challenges at once. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's, that's it. I'm okay, sorry. Tell you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Kim, up to you. Yeah. Um, Jonas, if you Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Give us your name and what you do. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senator Kim, and ahead. Senators. Thank you. My name is Jonas Abraha. I am the co-chair for CRSA, which is a coalition of refugee uh, resettlement uh, service agencies. So CRSA helps the refugee when they arrive here. And the coalition has about 23 uh, different organizations. And before that, if you allow me, I was just sitting here thinking, if this would be an opportunity where I come from, I would not have been refugee. So thank you for that. Because most of us end up refugees, leaving our school, our family, everything behind because of this opportunity, democracy that offers. So for that, thank you. So uh, our organization, our coalition supports this bill. The reason we support this bill is as soon as uh, some of the agencies receive, they welcome the refugee when they arrive here at the Atlanta airport. This is the first airport that they come. Once they come to the airport, the first thing they ask is, if they left their school, hey, I want to continue my education. I want to continue my education. Because by doing that is the way for them to give back to the country that has given them opportunity. And for us to tell them, hey, you can't, you can't, you can't afford it because you, you are considered out of state. It's very difficult to explain that because this is the only state that they have. And a lot of them, they have, especially like the Afghanis and now the Ukra Ukrainians, they have left, like they have certification that they need in order to continue with their career. So for all that reasons, we say 
this is a fair bill. This is a necessary bill that we needed because Georgia is one of the best states. I came as a refugee. I'm an Eritrean refugee. I came here, went to Korski High School. I went to West Georgia. I went under my undergrad. I like it so much there. I got my master's from West Georgia. I was even thinking about becoming a professional student, which was not possible, but I like Carrollton. So for that, most Georgians, you know, they help us. For me, it wasn't for my school, for my teachers, all those things I would not have gotten. So we, as the coalition, we are asking for this bill as soon as possible, if it's possible. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Jackson, one, one more person. Just one? Yeah. We are, we're running out of time. It's great. Great presentation. We appreciate them. You don't, don't mess it up now. So, thank you. Yes, ma'am. It's an honor to be here and talk about the positive Tell impact us your name and, and necessity of this bill. I'm Hasina Alakulzai, one of the new resettled Afghan refugee in Georgia. I've been here for one year and my family relocated here after the Taliban took over the country. Most of my family members are here, and we are all excited and motivated to track our career back here. And also, we are excited that what the U.S. provide for us, especially for me as a woman from Afghanistan. Before the Taliban seized in Afghanistan, the number of children out of school were 3.7. When the Taliban seized in Afghanistan, the Taliban banned women from education. So the number moved to 6.2 million people or children. Today, Afghanistan is the only country that forbidden it is half of its population from education, which are girls and women. So the new resettled Afghan in the USA are the only hope of my country. I'm optimistic that one day they lead the country, they break the chain of human rights violation and this inequality of mine in my country. However, beginning a new life in USA is not easy. We face many challenges. Since coming to USA or to Georgia, I have been looking for opportunities to obtain my master degree in public health in Georgia to, and also to support my family financially at the same time. But I couldn't make this in Georgia. So I didn't give up. And I, lo I, have been, I began looking for opportunities in other states uh, happily, I made it, and now I'm awarded the prestigious uh, scholarship of Peter Salama with the School of John Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. And uh, so I'm leaving Georgia, but I'm optimistic one day I can be productive to the economy of this country or Great. my second homeland. Thank Georgia. you, ma'am. Great. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being here. Um, just, Senator Byrne. Just, just a qu quick question, please. First, uh, thank you, thank you for coming, and thank you for sharing. Um, where did you? Uh, what is your undergraduate work in? So I did my uh, yes, I did my undergraduate in Kabul Medical University, BSPH was B Bachelor of Public Health, Very and good. then I started working with Ministry of Public Health of Afghanistan, and then I continued my career with UNICEF or United Nations Children Emergency Fund as a nutrition officer. And I work with the uh, Nutrition Emergency and Development Program for around five years. Thank you. And, and, and currently, are you employed? Do you have the opportunity to work? Yes. I'm working as an interpreter with the Department of Public Health of Georgia. Mm. With the <laughs> yes, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank with the DeKalb County Board of Health Refugee Program. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Senator Burns, for the question. Let's do one may more. have one moment? One more, please. Uh, one more speaker, or may one I more, close? No, one more speaker. Yeah, well, great. Um, I wish we had more time. This is very interesting, but we don't. No, that's that's okay. Um, who do we want? David? David? Um, if David Garcia from Galilea. <laughs> tell us your name, and tell us where you come from and tell us what you're doing now uh, uh, sure um thank you for having me i'm david garcia i work for an organization named galeo impact fund and we advocate for the latino hispanic community throughout georgia i'm also a first generation u.s citizen uh, georgia resident college graduate and military veteran um, i graduated from marietta high school and joined the marine corps shortly after 
I served as a U.S. Embassy guard in Peru, China, and Serbia, and I also worked as a contractor for the U.S. Department of State in Mexico, Bosnia, and Iraq. And throughout my time in service, I had the privilege of working closely alongside many host country nationals who, who were vital to, to advancing U.S. interests worldwide. Uh, during my time in Iraq, I routinely worked with many young Iraqis who had committed most of their lives to supporting our efforts there and their support, warmth, and commitment to our mission was vital to, to our success. And the same can be said for the thousands of Afghan citizens who supported our efforts there as well. Um, I currently live in Decatur, Georgia, which is very close to Clarkston, where I volunteer with many refugee serving agencies, including Clarkston Community Center, Refuge Coffee, Friends of, Yep, Friends of Refugees, and Clarkson United Methodist Church. I've met many refugees and special immigrant visa holders in Clarkson who served alongside U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. And according to the U.S. to the, according to the Atlanta History Center, uh, more than 1,500 Afghans have resettled in Georgia over the past two years. Uh, to me, this bill is about supporting a group of of people undergoing major life transitions, and and I can relate to many of the challenges that they face. Um, adjusting uh, to life after living abroad is, is very difficult. Um, my first year back in the U.S. after after serving abroad was was very challenging, and and having structure is key in in transitioning successfully. Higher education education and the opportunities that come with being a student on college campus can, can help immensely in easing one's transition. And I think that making higher education more accessible for a group of people who have supported our country and our foreign policies is the least that we can do. And I ask for your support in this bill. Timing was just right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service and appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, we have, um, oh, Senator Hostel. Uh, I could do this later, but I guess I want to make one point obviously is finance jar work and incentives and trying to get people trying to make the state better the biggest problem we have in the state right now is workers the limiting factor on our economy in georgia is workers and um these people are here legally so i'll stop there thank you <laughs> senator Orr. thank you uh, uh i certainly was going to look, start with um Mr. Chairman, with the, the, the point of our workforce shortage. But number two, we've heard from the chancellor of our great university system about the decline in enrollment and, and the need, he speaks urgently in our budget hearings, of the need to step up uh, uh, enrollment figures in our university system. And so we certainly have the slots there. Uh, uh, and I think the case has been strongly made, a uh, meritorious case for uh, moving ahead with this initiative and let's catch up with Tennessee. Thank you. I, I think I think Senator Williams has a statement. Not on this one, but on the yeah, yeah, the previous one. What, what what number are you? Uh, well, let me say, Kent, Senator Jackson, thank you so much. I wish I, I could listen to this for a good long time. I appreciate appreciate your passion. I know the committee appreciates your passion on this. And thank you all for being here. You know, we um, let's, let, let's, let's move it forward, not next week, but next session, okay? May I make one closing statement? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I do want to thank you so much for having this hearing. I want to acknowledge that there's a family that's come um, here that's from Ukraine. Um, they came to witness our democracy oh, wow, to be cool. a part of this conversation. And so I, I understand we're on a time limit, but I, I want to at least acknowledge their presence. And, um, and I do hope that we can continue this conversation. We will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Number 13. Yes, uh, sir. I'd we, like to make a motion. We take 228 off the table and we go back and we amend this to fix this bill. Okay, sure. What is your suggestion? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Get off the <laughs> Okay, do I have a second? Second, Senator Harrell, second. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Okay. As usual. Um, all right, my, I'd like to take 228 and strike part two, which will be lines 95. Wait, hold on. Okay. Hold through on. Through 147. Oh, okay. I'll second that. Wait, 95. Oh, the whole, whole yeah, section. Yeah, whole section two. Whole section. Oh, okay. Do we, need to, do we need to have a motion first? We need to make a motion to 
pass the to amend the we gotta, bill. We got to put the bill up. First. Okay. Um, you say we got to have a motion to do pass. Yeah, just two point two. No, we got first. I'll give you a motion to pass the bill, and then we'll amend it. Do pass. Okay. Do pass. In a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We don't have to. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Be patient. <laughs> Okay. All right, the motion is to strike section 2.2. 2.2. 2.2. 2.1. Moment. That is page 5 from line. Just. Are, are we clear where we're at? What bill? I'm sorry. Okay, let's go back. Senator Williams, start. If you would start back over again. All right, I want to strike section. Wait, tell us where we're at exactly. Senate Bill 228. Senate Bill 228, LC number 491442S. I'd like to amend the bill by striking section 2.2, which is lines 115, 114 through 147. Yeah, through one, 136. Okay, let's go back and make sure. Let's repeat all that again, please, sir. Okay, and we're again on LC 491442S, as in Sam. Correct. Oh. Yes, sir. Time he wanted to take out all of part two. Yeah, don't, uh, I revised it in, in the motion that he recognized. I will start with section 2.2. Lines 115. Starting with line 114. And what line do you go to? I'm confused. Through one yeah, 136. Yeah. Uh, okay, y'all, 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 hold on just a second. Hold on, be, be careful. No. Okay, hold. so we'll go all the way through 147. Okay. Okay. Because part three only applies to section 2.2. Oh, thank you for the clarification. Okay, let, let, let's regroup. Because I know everybody is right. anxious. Well, uh, you want me to restate the motion? Everything. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. We are take going to now. talk real slow. Exactly. Talk, 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 talk like you're talking to a family about okay. what, what you do. Okay. Like you're explaining the bill to them. Uh, Senate Bill, what? Bill 228. LC 491442S. I would like to amend that by striking lines 114 okay. through 147. Okay. And I'll second that. Okay, hold on just a second. Is everybody okay now? I'd like to make another amendment. Yes. Hold on just a second. Yes. Well, I'm going to be yeah, we got to deal with this. All right. So does everybody know what he's talking about now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do too. Okay. Senator Beach, do you follow me? I got you. Thank you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay. Um, do, so do we make, we take, we, we, you have an amendment, Senator Moore? You have another amendment? Well, um, oh, I'm sorry. To my, to my, to my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, I mean, there's the issue with 97 through 113 is, a, is a, just another additional mandate, to my understanding. So, I mean, I understand your amendment, but what, what is the purpose? What are you trying to accomplish with that amendment? Well, I'm, I'm going back to the original bill, and I'm just taking out this other part from this section one, line 114. <laughs> getting rid of the uh, juvenile justice part, that will just have to be cleared up. So I'm just going back to the original bill. We have a shortage of nursing and nurses, and uh, that's what this bill was originally for. And the military part, you're leaving it in. Uh -huh, and the military part. 
Did that help you? Yeah. It does? Mm. Okay, okay. So do you want to <coughs> keep your memory or you want to strike your memory? No. Or you, you, um, or you want to? I don't think he had an amendment. He was just had an issue no, with my he amendment. Had an issue with it? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to add um, lines 97 through 113 as well. So that would be a second proposed amendment. Okay. Any, dis any discussion? Please. Point of order. At least first. I. We come back. Okay, so we do. So we do Senator Williams first. Okay. So, clarification: we will vote on um, Senator Williams' amendment first. Okay. And that is to. Again, House Bill 228, LC 491442S. And your amendment would be to strike lines 114 through 147. Seven, that's correct. Okay. Everybody, everybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's your motion. I have a second. I second it. And Senator Hostetter second. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. All but Senator Senator Harrell, you vote Aye. vote against it. Vote against it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to clear it up. Okay, we just want to clear it up. Okay. Now we take up. Great. We take up Senator Moore's. Okay. He made the motion. Anybody second? Second. What is his amendment? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you got to make the motion first. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to um, amend um, LC 491442S by removing section or lines 97 through 113. 95. I'm sorry, 95 okay. through 113. Second. We have a second. Okay, uh, Senator Byrne. Uh, just a question for the for the <coughs> senator. Uh, is your concern on lines 101, 104, 106, and 108, the word shall, do you see this as a mandate? That, that's correct, Senator. So, so uh, again, uh, wouldn't it, it not be beneficial to allow this to happen? Well, you're mandating it to happen. I, I, I understand that, but the question is, would it be beneficial to allow this to happen? I'm not so sure it would. Okay. Um, I think I, it would be. I, I would. I would yeah. I would ask that instead of striking these terms that you consider an option. Well, I think the only other option then would be May, and if it's just May, what's the purpose in having it in the legislation? They can if they want to now. They can if they want to now. That's, that, I, so, I, that's, that was my question, Senator. That's unnecessary ink and paper. Thank you very much. Okay, so we got a motion and a second to strike lines 95 through 113, correct? We, we all together on that? Okay. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, all opposed. One, two, three, four. Looks like your motion carries. Okay. Okay, now, um, do we also, now we, we also carried, so, we, so in essence, what this means, we have now, help me out. We've now voted and approved to strike lines 95 through 114 and then 114 through 136. Is that correct? 147. 147. Oh, excuse me, 147. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Call the question. Is that? Yeah. All in, so all in favor of, of all that, raise your hand. Okay. As amended. As amended. As amended. No discussion. No, we're going to read a good one. <laughs> okay. Motion carries. Did you get my opposed? Yeah. Yeah, we, well, we, 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 we know that's going to happen always. Um, okay. Um, we, we got one more bill, but I don't, I don't see him here. 
Yeah, you see, okay, see him regularly. Okay, um, I guess we're going to be adjourned, and then we'll see y'all next week. Thank y'all. Next weekend. Just next week. Okay. Huh?